I remember Sean saying father and son, and in my head I'm like, I'm so in. I'm pretty sure I stood up. I think we might have been high-fiving. It wasn't full-on Wolverine like Logan, but it was close, and it was enough to give me that, that X-Men thrill. I'm going to take you back a little early. I remember meeting Sean in an airport lounge. Do you remember? It was New York. It was New York. And we were strangers. I believe we were both with our family. And I could see he was like a phone charger short. My phone was out to run out. And I asked Sean, and we never stopped talking and became friends. Like, we hung out, and it was like, we've got to find something to do together. I remember finally Sean said, I've got it. I've got the thing for us. This was a, an interesting origin story because when Hugh and I got this script, the script was good, but it was definitely about boxing robots, about this kind of imagined sport, but where Hugh and I really had a meeting of the minds and more critically a meeting of the hearts was, okay, let's do a cool as hell boxing robot action movie, but let's actually use that as a Trojan horse for a father-son movie. And let's make a movie about forgiving our fathers, connecting with our offspring, and very much a warm, gooey center in the middle of this muscular metal machine concept. It's been a long time. You know, I'm your- You screwed me. Nice mouth. Do you know where they're going? Italy? Yeah, Italy. So how did I get stuck here with you? Relax, kid. You've got a whole life of fine living ahead of you. We met here, right, Sean? Didn't we meet yeah. at my place? Yeah. The other trip I remember also in New York was going to pitch Spielberg, my take, and why I was the director he should choose. The whole thing, it was all predicated, I remember this vividly, on, I don't know how we're going to get there, but the last round of the last fight, it has to be Hugh Jackman shadow boxing right. and getting his redemption yes. moment. Not just for himself, but more importantly, his kid needs to see it. Yeah. His uh, kid needs to see it. I, I, just I get goosebumps I'm too, man. It. I think we got goosebumps there at my diner and table, which is just over there, because I remember Sean saying father and son, and in my head I'm like, I'm so in. Like, I'm so in. Um, we both share that in common, and clearly so many people around the world, because they come up, up to me, particularly dads, a lot of dads come up to me. Kids love the movie, but a lot of dads come up to me. At 10 years old, you're not too nervous. You know, you've got nothing to worry about. Everything's taken care of for you. But uh, I remember I went into the room, the final audition with Hugh and Sean. And the performance I gave just felt so real to me. It wasn't even a performance at that point because I'd been studying it so long. And I just remember it, it worked like magic. It felt so good. And uh, I walked out of there probably the happiest a 10-year-old can possibly be, and in the most mature state a 10-year-old can possibly be. This is a Spielbergian, like a boy saved by the other. That is the formula of Real Steel. That's E.T. And the spirit of that movie that I was going for, like you can substitute Max Kenton and Adam for Elliot and E.T. So there was something very Spielbergian about Dakota, his quality, his look, and then Every day, Hugh, Dakota, and me finding those scenes. And sometimes Dakota would come into a scene and be perfect. And sometimes it took a lot of takes uh, and a lot of improv and a lot of Hugh suggesting things, me suggesting things. And we got to a performance that ended up having such beauty and power. When we were talking about me doing the film, I was on my way into retirement. And I didn't, I was done. I was like, I, I, <laughs> but it was you, you know, sitting there across from me in a chair going, eventually this story is, and you, you just were all hard. And I was like, Oh, I want to do this. I really want to do this. And it was the first time I felt really like my ideas were being heard. And that was a new thing for me. That was, that was one of the first times I'd experienced what it meant to be a collaborator on set as a performer and not just someone who stands on their mark and reads their lines. But yeah, so partly I think he might, you could credit him to a certain degree for the fact that I'm still acting today. <laughs> also, I feel like I should be sharing directing credit on Ant-Man and the Wasp. I feel like Peyton Reed should be sending me half of his totally. residuals. I think you should get on that. I think your agent's going to get on that. Yeah. Being a dad, I've seen the evolution of going from, you know, meeting your kid for the first time to falling in love with your kid and then your kid being your best friend. So, you know, 
that's one of the things in this movie that I thought when I read it, uh, it was really powerful and uh, spoke to me because of my relationship with my dad and because of my relationship with my son. And he offered me the part with the idea of the part growing throughout the, uh, you know, hopefully the, the series. Cause I was like, man, we could do part two. We could do part 10. Like this, I wanted it to be like the fast and the furious series. You know, it's like, there's so many different worlds, um, uh, that we could explore and so many aspects of these characters that we could have spent off onto. Everybody came to this movie with such, um, such a warmth. We all felt like, I don't know what we're making here, but it doesn't feel like something else. And if it right. works, I think, People are going to love it. Yeah. And, uh, and you kind of take that leap of faith. And so, again, that we're here talking about it in 2021, a movie that came out in 2011 is uh, remarkable and definitely gratifying. Of course he lost, never gave him a chance. He wasn't that good. Noisy Boy was a great robot. Was, was a great robot back in the league, back in the day. But look around you, kid. This place, this place is where once great robots go to die. So throw them away. That's what you do, right? Anything you don't need, you just throw away. Wow. It's been a long night, all right? You want to sleep indoors tonight, shut up and get in the truck. Sean gave me a CD, that's how old it was, CDs, of the music that he imagined for the movie. And you played me that song, which ended up being in the movie. I alluded earlier to that I learned certain key lessons about being a producer from the way Spielberg produced me. And this is, I'm so happy you touched on this. Steven Spielberg was directing War Horse in the UK. And he calls me on a weekend after one week and he goes, on take four, there's something going on where Hugh Jackman is sitting there waiting for action, but something is happening with him. And he found this moment that is in the movie, Hugh Jackman, Hugh parks his truck. And I built this moment where he just sits there and the reflection of the Ferris wheel is on his face and you see a lifetime of regret. And that is the moment that Spielberg found and the moment that we created as a result. Okay, I, I, I can reveal. Uh, let me reveal what I was thinking about because I remember it well. I don't know if I told you at the time, but it's apropos of the theme of the movie. I was waiting there and I knew I had time. A thought flashed through my head about my dad. Just out of nowhere. And the song brought that up and I was just thinking about him. And so that's, if you want to go back and watch the DVD, that's that's what's going on there. We actually did have a conversation early on about the haircut. I remember that's I right. wanted you to have a pretty buzzed short haircut because I hadn't seen that's right. you with that look yeah. in the movie. But the other was, I remember when we first met, I was like, yeah, you know, like he doesn't box anymore. So you can be a little that's out of right. shape. I want to humanize right. him that way. Maybe a month before we shot, I'm like, remember all that stuff I said about how you be a little paunchy and flabby? I didn't mean any of that because we're still a movie after all. If I'm going to give people a, you know, a huge Jackman boxing movie and he's never really going to take his shirt off, at least he's going to be in some white t shirts. I remember very, very clearly wanting to not get up in the, or get caught up in the childlike wonder. I really wanted to show that this woman lives and breathes these robots. And she's quite a strong character, you know, and she's, she's always kind of tough and she's got a tough exterior shell. And in one of the rehearsals or one of the takes, I became overwhelmed while I was in the middle of the scene talking to him. It just became really real for a minute. And I, and I, and I turned away because I was starting to, to tear up. I was starting to get emotional. And then I kind of gathered myself and like, quickly just did this and came back into it thinking he might need to cut around that. And I remember it was like, Oh, Oh, that's, that's her that we just saw. We just saw something that was very specific. Like it felt like in that moment, we both understood Bailey a little bit better. And that was like, Oh, now, now I understand her. A long way down. If you fell, you definitely just yeah! I remember everything because at some points it felt like life or death. You, we were on a massive, massive set that was built from the ground up. We built that sluice with just gallons and gallons of water and mud and we hung Dakota off of that robot arm. And so when he looks back and he is dripping with mud and he looks terrified and cold and shivering, it's because he was. It's all part of what adds up to that magic. There was a lot of preparation. It's not like they just slung me off the edge and 
at 10 years old and I was scared. There was a lot of preparation. I would really enjoy going down that slide at a certain point. It became fun for me. So on the day when I was caked with cold, cold water and cold mud, because, you know, you have to make it really you can't just put all that in special effects. It's got to be some of it. Right. That was probably the moment where I said, OK, this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is work. I think every actor um, reaches that point where they realize their job isn't just fun when they do their first rain scene. It's always miserable. It was tough. It was cold out. But, you know, I don't think there was any other way we could have discovered Adam other than me nearly losing my life. <laughs> but it sets up this moment where he finds Adam, flashlights bouncing off the water, and his eyes lighting up when he sees the grill of Adam's face. It is, I love that moment so much. And it's like E.T. It's so a Spielbergian moment of wonder and discovery. It's also now very Stranger Things-ish, which is weird that I now realize that, oh, I just keep revisiting these magic childhood moments. Time when Adam is on the table, that was the first time I got to act with Adam. And when he sits up, and starts moving his head with me, I was just a 10-year-old in awe. There was no other way to, to put it. It was just real. And yeah, it was great. Oh, oh. Oh, watch out. Stay back. Dakota's a really, really great kid. Uh, he's not a kid anymore. He's, he's the sage of my son. You know, I, I remember in the first few days, my I, my job is really just to make him feel comfortable and to hang out and be with him. And I loved, I loved it. To be a kid that young and be opposite Hugh Jackman and have to go back and forth with him, you know, he held his own. And what he did was very impressive. I, I was always aware this is his first movie. He's on a massive Hollywood set. There are thousands of extras. I had done a whole bunch before I walked onto like an X-Men set where I saw, I was 30 years old when I walked onto that. I would always talk to him about Canada and I'm like, oh man, you know, like, have you ever had this or have you ever gone there or have you ever did this? And he's like, dude, I'm 12. Like, oh, that's right. <laughs> but he was, a, I mean, he was a great kid with a lot of energy. But your participation as a 10 year old in that film for me as an adult performer was the most magical thing because having a 10 year old on set with you and seeing this world, seeing these robots through the eyes of a 10 year old, I found myself, it was like no acting required. All I had to do was just watch you and I would just react to what you were doing. And it was like, holy cow, this is, you know, this is really magical. And I, and I do credit you, Sean, for having had those real robots as somebody who has spent 17 years wrapping my body around a stick in a tennis ball, pretending it's a dwarf, like the whole nine yards, I've done so much of it. And it does not produce the same results as having something real to interact with. It just doesn't, no matter how well you perform. The reality is when you don't have to perform, when it's just there and you're reacting to it and re it, it's changing, it makes magic. The places that would let you fight this robot would make you pee your little pants. Excellent. Get him a fight. Stubborn kid. Surprise, surprise. It's the first time Charlie Canton teaches Adam uh, to memorize some human boxing moves. So that's a, a stuntman named Eddie, who Hugh has worked with several times, yeah. who is playing Adam. So Eddie is in a green unitard on stilts. And Hugh is there, one, one, two. And then, like, they stretch out in unison, yeah. and then they get faster, faster, faster. You're in, like, an old school, an outfit that we base on an old training image, a black and white photo of Muhammad Ali. I think you're even in, like, a boot. You're not even in a sneaker. So it's, like, the whole aesthetic of that movie from, from very early wanted to be timeless Americana. And I do think that's part of why the movie hasn't dated the way many movies do. It was crazy. The... Uh... The, the fight where I'm the, the host of the fight, we shot in the original uh, Ford factory where they built the Model T. So all of that stuff was practical. It was actually there. You know, just all of that was really, really realistic. And, you know, as actors, I think, 
Our job is to get back to that five-year-old, seven-year-old version of ourselves before we learn the words don't, no, and can't. Having the actual robots and you know the actual um, boxing ring that we were in and stuff like that, everybody just kind of bought into their characters, no matter how ridiculous or how extreme. You know, everybody in that movie played their characters to their fullest ability, and I think that's why it's so much fun. I would go into the middle of the ring, and I would get a microphone, oh, yeah. and I would be describing every punch, knowing that I was shooting the audience. And that was cra- the energy that we got from those extras in those real venues was a feeling I'll never forget. It was, I'll never be a famous. <laughs> that was it. But that's as close as I'll ever get to that. He run. did a stage dive at the end. We got it now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember specifically, you know, him telling me, you know, be as big and as ridiculous as you want. You know, he's like really, really hype this crowd up. Like you're selling them the best thing in the world. There was a few things I tried to do, you know, just like lines and trying to crack jokes and stuff like that, that he said was, you know, too much. You know, you put me in a circle of 20 extras and, you know, give me a microphone, you know, the, the jerk will come out. So <laughs> he had to tone that down a little bit. You know, I get asked a lot about why do we build real robots? And the story I always tell is when we would put you at 10, 11 years old in front of Adam, the wonder that I see in your face, being able to do those, right? Like we felt it when we filmed it and now it's in the movie forever and you can only get that because it was really happening. By the way, I still have Adam Adam from the waist up sits in the lobby of my production company. And it's my most treasured piece of memorabilia that I will ever have. And when they rolled, when they rolled the robot in, it changed the energy of the scene completely. And everybody, even when you watch the movie, you have so many people that's just standing there staring at the robot because they look so real. And the heads actually turned and the arms actually came up. You know, so it just it really intensified the experience of shooting those scenes. Wasn't that Stephen again? Didn't he say what he learned on Jurassic Park? Yes, good memory. Yeah, it just came to me. Having the animatronic dinosaurs on the first Jurassic was a game changer for two reasons, and that's why he recommended this. One, it helps the actors. But two, when you're a year later and you're doing visual effects and you're sitting there in a session in a dark room, you you get to a point where you've seen the movie 190 times and you can go, okay, that shot looks good. Yeah, I think we're done. But if you have a real robot to compare your digital robot to, you can never trick yourself. You can never bull yourself into thinking it looks real because you see what real looks like. So that was very good. That was more good, Stephen, advice. Absolutely. We taught him to box. You taught him to box. That's worth something. I think it is, too. I think it's worth 200 grand. 200 grand. Charlie, we can go round and round this all night long. Look at me. Look at me. But it's not going to happen. There was a real steel uh, pamphlet, booklet, breaking down all the robots. and all. I mean, it was really interesting. It really just broke down the entire world that we were living in. The robots, what their powers were, what their weaknesses were. So it was like Pokemon cards, almost, where you're reading about these different robots. And it was like, for every robot, what year it was designed, who designed him. We, we have so much um and this would probably be helpful if i ever succumbed to the endless request for a sequel but we have <laughs> including mine. hell yes including um, mine no, we just kind of compiled like a, a a robot bible with all the specs of every model and every robot uh so i have that somewhere all the robots were so very different because they were scrapped together and there were so many different arenas that the robots fought in so we really needed uh, like clear background context, it, it really becomes real. You know, when, what was it, Zeus or whatever his name was, when he walked in the ring, you know, Zeus was a hell of a bot. 
You know, Zeus was almost human, like when he was walking out to the ring and he looks down at the kid. That's very scary and intimidating, you know? I didn't even know it existed. I mean, I did know it existed, but I, no, not at all, actually. It's, I'm embarrassed to say I've never read it. Now, you, you, you might not have much robot, but with that dance, you got flair. Plus, you're a kid. People love that kid thing. I mean, what are you, like, 9, 10? I'm 11. Okay. Are you sure you're 11? Yes, I'm sure I'm 11. Okay, anyway, point is, people want to see that. For me, it's the the dance sequences with him and the robot. Like I would have never thought uh, to to put that in a movie. I would have I would have never thought to have this kid dance. But <laughs> when seeing them shoot that and being on set uh, around that, it was uh, I was I, I wish we had more of that. I mean, I had no experience with dancing whatsoever before this, but we had a wonderful choreographer Anne, who was just the best. She was like my best friend and we worked nonstop for multiple weeks. And bear in mind, we're asking an 11 year old kid to go to dance lessons, to learn this choreography that he was then have to do in front of thousands of extras and crew members. And he just jumped in. As a 10 year old, you don't have any, you know, negative thoughts. You're not thinking about what people are thinking of how good you are at dancing or whatnot. You're just having fun, right? So Honestly, there was no confidence issues whatsoever. It was just me going out there and dancing in front of hundreds of people and feeling great doing it. I know you can't hear me, but you can see me. So watch me. Watch me. You know you're talking to a robot. I know. Shut up. Watch me. That was Kobo Arena in downtown Detroit, so like a massive sports arena. And even though we couldn't fill it, we had like a thousand plus people every day. There's an energy and electricity in those arenas. You have Evangeline standing in the middle of 500 people. You have Anthony Mackie and Kevin Durand up in the stands where like the mean, tall, you know, Kevin is going to finally get his comeuppance. And that's the stuff you don't have to fake it. I love that final sequence. Actually, I remember watching it because I used to be a high jumper at school. And I remember when I saw the film back, I was like, I've got some air there. I've got some serious air on that final last punch in slow. And I, and I get it in slow-mo. I was three months pregnant when I came back to do that scene. And there were no other cast members. There was like a spattering of, I think, like 200 extras just around me. And I'm in this enormous auditorium that's like, echoingly empty and of course all these extras are all around me and when I get excited I'm like jumping onto the guy beside me <laughs> and I'm doing all this stuff but it's just me like there's nothing else going on and I felt a little bit like a lunatic what I think my editor and I talk about this a lot when you rewatch Real Steel the secret weapon in that final fight of Zeus versus Adam is that we not just cut Zeus, Adam, Charlie, and Max, the cutaways to Evangeline, who remember wasn't watching anything. She was watching me describing the fight. And she gets so emotional and so intense in the way she cheers. And she is the grace note in the evolution of that fight. And you'll note if you rewatch it, how many times we cut to Evangeline because she was just our secret weapon editorial secret weapon. Watching the movie became a double treat because I didn't know what to expect. That final scene to this day will choke me up. You know, every time I watch it, I can't watch it without getting emotional. And I can't watch Dakota dancing without being like, oh my God, it's so cute, I love him. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, Dakota, but when Charlie Kenton switches Adam to shadow mode in the last round against Zeus and and, and Dakota's watching Hugh return to this redemptive greatness. And Dakota, I mean, of course you remember, but we're watching a take. I have goosebumps all down my arms right now, guys. And this one tear just starts coming down Dakota's cheek. And I rem it's, I'll never forget this moment. And I could barely say cut because my throat was so tight with my own emotion. And I've really never done this where I managed to get out cut and I just went to Dakota and I held him. I was so grateful 
for this perfect moment and exactly the moment that I imagine when I pitched that idea for the last scene to Spielberg, which is how I got this job. That 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 that, that moment became completely real and this kid brought some magic to it. And it was just as I dreamt it. That I will never forget. They're already calling your bot the people's champion. Yeah! Max, what do you say to that? People's champion? Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah! Adam always lost, but we needed to give the audience and the characters some kind of victory. So this idea that Zeus wins, but that place doesn't give a crap about Zeus or Tak Mishido. They only care about Max and Charlie and Adam. I think that we did that as a pickup or a small reshoot after the fact, just so that in the midst of losing, there was a very clear feeling of victory. I think that there is so much value in, instead of sheltering our children from loss, teaching them how to deal with it, and what it means and what its value is in their life. There is disappointment and it doesn't end perfectly. And yet it's a perfect ending. That if you have love around you, you're enough. You're more than enough. Together you're, you're everything. And I think it's, it's still and will always be a, a meaningful and important um, story for kids. It's kind of got the same beauty, obviously, as the very first Rocky. And the journey is is always going to be a hard fight and you're not always going to win. And some kids, it's all about winning and it's all about succeeding, but you can succeed with a loss as long as you enjoyed it, as long as you enjoyed the journey and the lessons that you get from it will help you in the future. In a decade, there has not been a week where I don't get asked about a sequel to Real Steel. And while we are still never going to say never, honestly, we had some ideas right as we were finishing the movie, but none of them felt fully formed and special enough to mess with this movie that felt like, are we sure we can top it? And then also just being honest, the movie made like $300 million. But in retrospect, I think we would both agree that it was marketed as like Transformers Light but it was never Transformers. It, sh it was always a father-son movie. And if it had been released, frankly, I, I don't have hard feelings about this, but I think it's a fact. You, you're never going to out-robot Transformers. And so we did well, but not well enough. It wasn't like we made 500 million. And so a sequel was a no-brainer. So like the economics were on the bubble. We didn't have the perfect script idea. Um, it's still something we flirt with. I've always advocated for a sequel. And I'm like, if they can do a, you know, a sequel of other movies with robots boxing, they can definitely do a sequel to this movie just simply because the first one worked so much. Well, first of all, the first I heard about this resurgence was through your message to me about this interview. I had no idea that it happened, but it doesn't surprise me at all because after the film came out, I felt like every year that went by, more and more and more and more people discovered it and were madly in love with it. I mean, the first time I read the script, I, I cried. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a sweet kids robot movie, but um, the script made me cry. So in, let's go, make another. Um, like this is seriously <laughs> pumping me up for, for the sequel. Whatever enduring love fans have for Real Steel, Hugh Jackman and I share. We do. Bring it on. Bring it on. 